Jean Lawler, your host of the Roads to Resolution Closure Certainty podcast and video. It's great to be here with you today, and thank you so much for joining me. I know when I started my little mini series on insurance law uh, for mediators and mediations, I um, I uh, came up with five episodes, but I am making the executive decision to add episode 5.1 here, something else that crossed my mind that would be um, of interest probably, that is important anyway. And there's so many important issues, you can't just stop with five, but that's where we'll stop as part of this little mini series. So what are we going to talk about today? Again, let's get back to money and who's on first for funding settlement payments. You'll recall that in an earlier session, I talked about additional insured endorsements and contractual indemnity, basically risk transfer. That said, that's fine, but let, let's talk about another side of this that is different than that. And that is the insured's own policy limits and the insured's own policy and how that then affects the claims and lawsuits that might be asserted against the insured and who's making payments to settle those. So first and foremost, there is such a thing, a concept and a reality of burning limits. And that's a phrase that's used. And that's when the um, defense costs are paid within the policy limits. So they serve to reduce the policy limits as uh, the attorney, the defense attorney is paid. This is typically found in professional liability policies, professional indemnity, as it's called over in the London market. Uh, it could be an attorney, could be um, an architect, an engineer, I think doctors, others, basically uh, professional liability policies and directors and officers policies, for example, others may as well, but those are the more common ones. So burning limits. If you're in a burning limits situation, either as the claimant, the lawyer for the claimant, or the defendant who's your policy or your counsel, or the mediator who is mediating a matter and learns that there is a burning limits policy involved, then the goal of all, and uh, including this, there are certainly ethical uh, considerations to be considered, um, you know, is to see about getting that case solved, especially if it's a policy limit case, because the longer the lawsuit goes on, then the lower, um, the more the limits will be reduced and the less money there will be to pay a settlement or any judgment. And it is certainly the case where limits have all been um, wasted or wasting policies, another phrase that they might say, uh, to use for a burning limits policy, but where there there is no money left then after some settlements perhaps and some defense money's been paid and then there's another lawsuit, there's no money left to pay the indemnity on that, to pay the settlement. So if a burning limits policy is involved in a mediation in which you are involved, my suggestion is that you pay close attention to that and try and get the case settled upfront as soon as possible to maximize the available policy limits, both for the benefit of the insured and the benefit of the claimant. All right, thanks. Then where else would the insured be putting in money? For example, if the insured has a an SIR, self-insured retention, then that's something a lot of businesses would have, also under professional liability types of policies, DNO policies. So maybe the insured has first layer primary liability insurance for whatever type of insurance it is, but they have chosen to self-insure essentially for you know the first X dollars. Maybe it's a million dollar policy with a $100,000 SIR. Those are just numbers I'm using. Um, so for any settlement, if the settlement amount would be within the SIR level, then the insured is the one who is paying. If it is in excess of the SIR level, then the insured would be needing to put in whatever the amount of the SIR is as the first amount. And then the insurer, the first level insurer would pay the next amount. And if there is an excess insurer and it's a large claim that is greater than the available limits under the primary policy, then it would go to the excess layer. 
up that tower, so to speak. So that's what an SIR is. Um, a deductible. Actually, let me backtrack to SIR for a moment. Um, the SIR is paid up front, okay, to settle the claim. It's not something that an insurance company fronts the money for and then goes back and collects from the insured. Then that's when we get to a deductible. A deductible is just that. The insurer fronts the money, pays the money, and whatever the deductible amount is, then um, goes back and the deductible folks working at the insurance company go back and, and send the insured a bill for the amount of the deductible, or in some way they handle the deductible and the insured pays that to the insurance company, as opposed to the SIR situation where an insured is paying their money to the claimant. All right. Uh, we also have other insurance. There may be multiple policies of insurance and uh, getting the priorities of those straight or who's on uh, who's on or who's not or overlapping insurance. That's a whole course unto itself, but definitely the mediators need to know that. And then the, law the lawyers need to understand that. Also, additional insured insurance is not the same as ha you're not an additional insured if you just have a certificate of insurance. A certificate of insurance does not convey additional insured status. And I know some brokers will put, put it on there. Uh, you know, so-and-so is an additional insured and that's on a certificate of insurance. But the certificate of insurance does say on its face that um, that does not convey any rights or whatever. It's just there to let the holder of the certificate know that the policy is in effect. Silent cyber is an example of overlapping insurance. And if you do have a cyber incident of some sort, a, a breach that may involve data, it may not, usually will, of course, but um, it will involve something, then look at all your insurance because there will be overlapping insurance there. The who is an insured uh, um, section of any insurance policy is important to look at because a an insurance policy can provide insurance for more than just the named insured or the additional insured. It will also in, um, include insurance for others. And <clears throat> every policy is different on that. So it's very important to look at the who's an insured language. And then another example of this is UM, underinsured motorist and underinsured, let's see, uninsured motorist and underinsured motorist coverage. Um, in those cases, the first payment has to come from the, um, the liability policy, in that case, the auto, whether it's commercial auto or personal auto policy, of the tortfeasor, the one who was at fault. And if that insurance policy has lower limits than the policy does for the one who was injured or the, the one who was hit in an accident, for example, then that person who was injured will turn to their own insurance carrier under their UM or UIM coverage for uh, payment up to whatever their policy limits are. So in a nutshell, a lot of different sources are there for funding settlement payments, and it all depends on who's on first, I guess. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure. Please feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or, or subscribe to my podcast. Thank you so much and goodbye.